Well, thank you very much for your kind words and very generous welcome. Um, it really is great to be here with you in this very fine university and to make some new friends. And we always enjoy uh, doing that, my wife and I. Now, tonight's uh, topic, I believe, is one of the most important and pressing issues facing not just Christians, but everyone in the West today. It's more important than who the new president is. It's more important than Brexit. And therefore, it's important, it behoves us as Christians, to wrestle with this subject and to do so Christianly um, with the Bible as our basis. But in order to engage with the world, we must understand the world. And uh, my desire is always to bring, as it were, the Word of God and the world of God together in critical engagement. And I hope that's what we'll do this evening as we think of the tyranny of tolerance. But let me begin with a quote from none other than Plato. He said, The excess of liberty whether in states or individuals, seems only to pass into excess of slavery. And so tyranny arises out of democracy. And the most aggravated form of tyranny and slavery out of the most extreme form of liberty. Bear that in mind. Now, no one likes to be accused of being intolerant. To be branded as intolerant puts you in the same category as a fascist, a bigot, one who is subversive of democracy. And tolerance, it seems to me, has been elevated to the status of the ultimate virtue, alongside what may be thought of as the 11th commandment, thou shalt not offend. And this has led to a very interesting paradox. As a society, we can tolerate anything but intolerance. We must be intolerant of tolerance, so says the former British Prime Minister David Cameron. Now, such a view is both right and wrong. You see, it all depends upon what we mean by the word tolerance. Until relatively recently, tolerance was simply taken as the need for a society to allow people to practice and promote their beliefs without fear or favor. After years of infighting between the different branches of the Christian church following the Reformation in the 16th century, Europe eventually adopted a policy of toleration. In Britain, the Act of Toleration, 1689, was a major landmark. Thinkers like Roger Williams in America, uh, 1644, John Owen in Britain, 1667, believed that religious conflict, by which they meant, of course, conflict between Christians, did not serve the cause of Christ. Tolerance for them was a virtue born out of confidence in the ability for the truth to vindicate itself without the state needing to resort to force. The classic example of where this kind of tolerance works so magnificently is, of course, here in America. How was it that such a relatively high degree of religious toleration was achieved in the New Republic? Now, that is a very interesting question, well worth asking. Now, different theories have been put forward. The idea that tolerance in the Republic grew out of people having a weak religious commitment was developed by Alexis de Tocqueville. Put simply, people from different religious backgrounds tolerated each other because they didn't really understand the depth of their own beliefs and the entailments that followed. And so, according to Tocqueville, a sort of wishy-washy mix of weak convictions just got along fine. The evidence, however, would suggest otherwise. 
You need look no further than the religious writings of the great Jonathan Edwards to see the theological depth was a hallmark of many of the early founders of the New Republic. On the other hand, there is the strong religious thesis, which amongst other things proposes that through the influence of people like William Penn, the great case of liberty of conscience, 1670, and the Anabaptist plea for the separation of church and state as expressed in Rhode Island, many were persuaded to have a tolerant attitude towards the diverse religious sects and others which held deep convictions. Others still, like Marty, Martin Marty, put forward another reason for the success of the American experiment, what he calls the Republican banquet. The picture is of one of members of different religious views all dining at the same table, sharing in one common experience, namely that they had all been victims of religious intoleration at some point or another in the past. And so Marty writes that in reaction to their past, they were, quote, forced thus to come to terms with each other. They developed what Abraham Lincoln called bonds of affection and mystic cords of memory because of common experiences of a sort denied their ancestors. Now, I, for myself, am drawn to a different narrative which changes the metaphor from a Republican banquet to a Republican picnic. <laughs> and uh, this has been suggested by Stanley Gade. He argues that it was out of practical necessity that people were forced to get along. So as you picture different families on the picnic grounds, quote, each claiming their own turf, eating in relative solitude for a time, but increasingly forced to interact with other families as the popularity of the picnic area mushroomed. So, argued Gade, true toleration came about as a result of political necessity and later a genuine good. The result was a marriage, a marriage between truth and tolerance in the 16th century through to the 18th century. Now, it may have been a marriage of convenience, but it was a fairly stable marriage nonetheless. So put simply, the way folk operated with this understanding of tolerance meant that whilst I may not subscribe to your beliefs, I would hold views entirely different to the views you do hold. Nonetheless, I would fight for your right to hold your views and to express them. Now, that idea has been attributed to Voltaire, writing to René Descartes. He said, I do not agree with what you have to say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. Now, there are two things of note here. The right to believe does not mean that all beliefs are right. Here we're speaking about the right to believing, and that should be protected at all costs. It does not extend to protecting beliefs and their practices. For example, Sharia law. Secondly, this stance at least presupposes that there is something called truth over which people were disagreeing, but nonetheless tolerating each other. Now, friends, by and large, that is no longer the case. Because the very idea of tolerance has been drastically altered. Whilst in the past, to a greater or lesser extent, we lived in a pluralist society, that is a society made up of a variety of beliefs which could be discussed and argued about while hopefully showing respect, but still believing they can't all be valid. The shift has now changed towards pluralism. 
Now, this is the idea that all views are of equal worth. We're not dealing with facts, so it is claimed, but beliefs. And since beliefs are personal, with the accompanying idea that they're private, even subjective, what is true is true for me, then they should not be allowed to venture out into the public domain. Because that is where they are liable to become socially disruptive. What matters in the popular mind, at least, is the positive notion of sincerity. As long as a person is sincere in their beliefs, live and let live. And this is accompanied with the underlying negative assumption that people now have a right not to be offended. What is more, to claim that one belief is right and the others are wrong smacks of arrogance, a kind of intellectual imperialism. And all of this has been related to the shift that has taken place in the West with regards to an understanding of truth, which has been relativized. So truth, like beauty, we're told, is very much in the eye of the beholder. And this lies at the heart of postmodernism. And here the question is no longer, is it true? But whose truth is it? This is well illustrated by an article in a best-selling magazine in Britain, which I was reading not too long ago, which included this little piece of advice given by Damien Barr for those who would wish to write their memoirs. And I quote, Too many facts get in the way of truth. <laughs> the truth is what you feel. The facts are what you know and can argue about. Pluralism and relativism and indeed subjectivism are closely intertwined. Now here we've got to make an important distinction between what is called sociological pluralism on the one hand and philosophical pluralism on the other. Now sociological pluralism simply recognizes the diversity of beliefs and practices in a society. Different people dress in different ways. They have different languages, different accents, different cuisines, so on and so forth. I happen to like Chinese food. I certainly like Texan steak after last night. <laughs> Others prefer Tex-Mex. And we're not necessarily worse off for having these different cultures living side by side, intermixing in a modern Western society. On the contrary, a good case could be made that it is enriching in so many ways. Again, you in the United States illustrate this beautifully. Now, that is simply the fact of the way things are, sociological pluralism. Philosophical pluralism is a different thing altogether. According to this view, to claim that one religion is better than another is inherently wrong. Beliefs, like moral values, are relative. And the pressure then begins to mount that in order to make sure that we have a tolerant society, that is, according to the new tolerance, those who do not buy into this belief cannot be tolerated. And they must be made to see the error of their ways, and if necessary, silenced. So putting it simply, sociological pluralism is descriptive describing how things are. Philosophical pluralism is prescriptive, declaring how things should be. Now, it might be worth asking at this point whether it is desirable to use the term tolerance at all, even the old-style tolerance, for a very fundamental reason, namely that the word Tolerance contains within it a power equation. The strong tolerating the weak. The clever tolerating the not so clever. The majority tolerating the minority. The government tolerating its citizens and so on. 
So the word which might come much closer to encapsulating that which is desirable and is more in line with, say, the tolerance of John Locke, maybe the word respect. So whatever our standing in relation to others, we accord respect for the basic rights. Traditionally construed in terms of the right of freedom of conscience or believing, freedom of expression, and freedom of assembly. You recognize that? It's your First Amendment, 1791. Now, I'm sure that you here tonight will appreciate that we're not dealing with some abstract ideas because a seismic shift in our culture has taken place, having profound effects on every strata of society. So let me furnish you with one or two examples of the way the new intolerance tolerance, is working itself out. In 2005, Noah Reiner, the president of Dartmouth Student Assembly, addressed a convocation welcoming freshmen to the campus. He spoke of education being much more than acquiring information. It also involved, he said, the development of character. Much of this, he said, came through self-sacrifice. And I quote, the best example of this is Jesus. He knew the right thing to do. Well, Noah then briefly spoke about what Jesus achieved on the cross. And that is when controversy ensued. The vice president of the student body wrote to him, complaining that his choice of the topic was, quote, reprehensible and an abuse of power. And reflecting on this, Reiner insightfully observed that it was not the case that Dartmouth had a speech code which would be easy to deal with. Rather, it had a speech culture. And that culture said that some topics are not only off limits, but they cannot be uttered. Another example comes from Brown University during the Gulf War. Some students decided to fly American flags outside their dorm windows to show support for the troops fighting in the Persian Gulf. Subsequently, the university authorities asked for the flags to be removed for no other reason that the practice might offend other students who do not support the war. But it's not only in America, but also in Britain. Let me give you one example from Britain. And I quote the newspaper article. When Patricia, Patricia Gearing's daughter died of Batten's disease in 1998, her grave was marked by a simple cross. Before long, Mrs. Gearing was instructed by the local authority to remove it. Their rules said, and I quote, crosses are discouraged as excessive uses of the supreme Christian symbol are undesirable. The family was given permission to erect a headstone featuring Mickey Mouse. Now, one of the results of this change is the privatization of convictions. Under the new order, we can hold whatever convictions we like so long as we don't express them. Or to be more precise, there are convictions which are allowed to be expressed and only expressed. And that is the conviction that all views are valid and is not proper to question other people's beliefs and behavior except those who believe you should question beliefs and behavior. In a nutshell, the traditional view of tolerance which nurtured freedom of thought and speech in the West for centuries, enabling people to get alongside each other, albeit not without difficulty at times, was the view that the person whose views are different should be tolerated or respected unless they threaten the well-being of society. For example, uh, pedophilia. The new toleration, however, insists that it is the views which are to be tolerated. In fact, more than that, they're to be celebrated. 
I want us now to think for a moment of two ways this new toleration is being enforced almost unconsciously in the sense that living in a modern world makes it seem not only plausible, but desirable, even for professing Christians. In other words, at the level of our gut reactions, many of us are finding ourselves being lured into becoming relativists. First, there's an increased awareness of other people's beliefs in all their bewildering variety, and not least through the internet, or TV. Now, this is what I call the supermarket effect. So you think of what happens, say, when you go into a mega store to buy a tube of toothpaste. Now, I guess for guys, toothpaste is toothpaste, what the heck? But then that just adds to the bewilderment when the poor fellow is standing there with rows and rows of the stuff. You know, how do you choose between them? You have minty flavor, you have strawberry flavor, you have toothpaste with whitener, you have toothpaste with extra fluoride, and on and on it goes. Well, one response is to say, well, it's just a matter of personal preference. Whatever works for you. The temptation is then to think, it's all relative. Sure, there may be one or two differences, but they're more or less all the same. After all, toothpaste is toothpaste. And so, in an act of desperation, our bewildered male shopper closes his eyes, he reaches out his hands, and places gum gel for teething babies into the shopping trolley by mistake. <laughs> now, the point I'm making is this, is that the supermarket effect can spill over into the way we approach other faiths and ideas. Is it really the case we begin to think that one belief is just as good as another? Beneath, they're all the same. They're just packaged differently. Is it simply a question of personal preference? It certainly may, seem, it may feel like that at times. And so we have one of Bob Hope's celebrated one-liners when he once said, I do benefits for all religions. I'd hate to blow the hereafter on a technicality. But think for a moment now of the experience that many of our students have today. And uh, this, I think, has been helpfully sketched out by Stanley Gade. Consider, he writes, the day of a typical university student. Let's call him Steve. At 8 a.m., he takes a shower while talking to his roommate about the keg party the night before. At 8.30, he has breakfast with a Hare Krishna devotee, who not only didn't attend the party, but doesn't even drink Coke. At nine, he attends an ecology class, where the predominant assumption is that humankind and nature are one. Later in the library, he begins work on a research paper exploring a neo-Marxist interpretation of the fall of the Soviet, Soviet empire. Afterwards, he meets his girlfriend for lunch and conversation, the overriding theme of which is how the two feel about one another. In the afternoon, he attends a lecture on microeconomics that offers an entirely different interpretation of the Soviet collapse. And this is followed by a quick dash to the lounge so he can catch another installment of As the World Turns. <laughs> now, the point is, modern students and much of the rest of us find ourselves swept into a wide variety of discrete frames of reference on a daily basis. There's a sort of constant switching from one way of thinking to another. And this not only adds to the feeling that everything is relative, different views are, well, just different views like different toothpaste, but it makes it difficult to have any integrity. That is a, a frame of reference which integrates these different experiences in a meaningful way. The result is that we can undergo a kind of cognitive dissonance, a feeling of mental disorientation, especially for the Christian. And so on Sunday night, in the world of church, the Christian sings, Jesus is Lord. But on Monday morning, 
in the real world of cut and thrust business or lectures, there are many lords to contend with. And so the temptation to go with the flow, to separate off our religious life from our intellectual life, from our moral life and our social life, and so buying into the new tolerance will be almost irresistible. Secondly, our modern view of freedom enforces the new view of tolerance. You see, for the ancients, it mattered what we chose. For moderns, being a consumerist society, it is that we choose. The ability to make choices we see as expressing our freedom. And not surprisingly, the more we can choose from, the more we think we are free and therefore significant. Descartes' cogito ergo sum, I think therefore I am, has been transmuted into volo ergo sum, I choose therefore I am. And so we can understand how this moves into the question of gender and transgender. Some, like feminist Judith Butler, argue that gender, male or female, is a social construct, not a biological given. And so the ultimate choice is of our gender. Hence the perceived right for people to be transgender stating their preferred gender regardless of their biological sex. And so we not only have lifestyle choices, but life meaning choices, which enhances our feeling of self-esteem even further. So here in the West today, meaning is no longer given to us by God, it is something we choose. We choose. Now, what I want to do is to look at the issue of pluralism and this new tolerance a little more closely from a Christian perspective. First of all, pluralism, in the sense that a variety of beliefs and practices exist side by side, is nothing new. Old Testament Israel was born into a pluralist world. As they entered the Promised Land, Israel was surrounded by a bewildering array of beliefs and practices vying for their allegiance. Accordingly, the Israelites were confronted with the religions and rituals of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Moabites, the Hivites, the Termites, and all the other ites. <laughs> but they were quite clear in their understanding that Yahweh, the God of the universe, who had revealed himself to them, forbid them adopting the beliefs of these other people. However sincere the worshippers of the god Molech may be, the Jews were not to tolerate the sacrifice of children by burning them alive to their idols. But, according to our free-thinking modern-day pluralists, the Jews should have simply recognized that baby burning was different. It wasn't wrong. Secondly, the early Christians went even further. Most of them, as you know, were Jews. But they said that the God of the Old Testament had come into history in the form of a carpenter from Nazareth. They claimed this was not myth. This was not just an idea. It was a matter of historical fact, on the same level as Caesar crossing the Rubicon. They'd heard him. They'd met him. they touched him, as the Apostle John writes in 1 John 1. They were, as it were, forced to believe and teach this. Not out of fear, not out of coercion, but out of conviction. It's what the great B.B. Warfield would describe as false consent. When you're faced with the truth, you've just got to admit it and submit to it. 
They could no more deny that Jesus was Lord and Savior than Galileo could deny that the earth revolved around the sun. And here you see the Christians went against the political correctness of their age. This was the time of the Roman Empire. Edward Gibbon describes the religious scene in this way. The various modes of worship which prevailed in the Roman world were all considered by the people as equally true. By the philosophers as equally false. And by the magistrates, that is the government, as equally useful. You see, the Romans had no problem in adding a new God to their list. But the Christians said, no, there's only one God. And he can only now be known through his son, Jesus. The result? They were not tolerated. They were tortured. And this leads on to the main reason why this view of pluralism and the new tolerance is quite intolerable. Because at the end of the day, it is harmful to the issue of truth and therefore is a threat to toleration itself. Let me illustrate this by telling you the experience of a friend of mine. This is true. My friend went to a meeting of the Flat Earth Society. It does exist. <laughs> My friend said there was one speaker there. He seemed sincere. He looked sincere. He acted sincere. But my friend, who is a Christian, thought that he, the speaker's facts were plain wrong. Now, the observer admitted this was intolerant of him. Maybe the speaker wasn't wrong. Maybe if the advocate of the flat earth theory was as sincere as he looked, he was right. Perhaps the crowd was wrong, although they looked sincere too. Perhaps they were both right. Maybe the earth was flat for the speaker, but round for the crowd, and just confusing to my friend. But of course, if that were the case, then things would keep changing. They'd keep moving from a world being flat to being round and being flat again and keeping going on, depending upon who was believing at the time. Provided, of course, the person believed sincerely. But the odd thing was this. The crowd was not very tolerant of the little man from the Flat Earth Society. They didn't listen to his arguments. They jeered him, as no doubt in the same way people jeered at Galileo and Copernicus for arguing in the opposite direction. Naturally, they were intolerant of him because he was being intolerant of them because he was claiming to be right. If only, perhaps, he'd been claiming that people can believe nothing of or everything about the world, then it might have been given an easier ride. But I doubt that would have been acceptable either. Because the world is either flat or it's round. And it cannot be both. You see, this is the tyranny of relativism which masquerades as tolerance because it soon becomes intolerant. Some people, let alone their views, are not to be respected. And this is often the case with people's attitude towards Christians. So you believe in God? Well, some people do, some people don't. You're sincere, I'm sincere, your God helps you, my non-God helps me, Let's just live together in tolerance. But of course, such tolerance is fake. It's not simply disagreeing to disagree and still getting on with each other. That's the old tolerance. It's saying that when it comes to certain things, truth does not matter. And the move from the belief that truth does not matter to forcing people to agree that truth does not matter is but a small one. Tell me, what do you do with a Christian who makes this sort of claim that as a matter of fact, 
Jesus is or is not God incarnate. Or that he did or did not rise from the dead. He could not have remained dead and risen from the dead at the same time. That's nonsense. We may disagree about the facts and still continue to live in the same society. That would be what Professor J. Budzewski describes as true tolerance. But to accept each other's beliefs based upon both being right, when we're clearly contradicting each other, is intolerable. And it's intolerable because it comes at too high a price, namely the price of truth. But for the sake of promoting a certain view of tolerance, which involves relativizing beliefs, that is when persecution is just around the corner. And of course, that is what happened in a society not too dissimilar to ours, first century Rome. Now here are some words of the 19th century British Prime Minister, William Gladstone. Listen very carefully. Rome, the mistress of statecraft, and beyond all other nations in the political employment of religion, adding without stint or scruple to her lists of gods and goddesses, and consolidated her military empire by the skillful medley of all the religions of the world. Thus it continued while the worship of the deity was but a conjecture or a contrivance. But when the rising sun of righteousness, he's talking of Jesus, had given reality to the subjective forms of faith, and had made actual and solid truth the common inheritance of all men, the religion of Christ became, unlike other new creeds, an object of jealousy and cruel persecution, because it would not consent to become a partner in the heterogeneous device, and planted itself upon the truth and not the quicksand of opinion. He then said, Should the Christian faith ever become but one among many co-equal pensions of government, it will be proof that subjective religion has again lost its God-given hold upon objective reality. And when, under the thin shelter of its name, a multitude of discordant schemes shall have put upon a footing of essential parity, in other words, saying all religions are the same, and shall together receive the bounty of legislature, that is, government backing it, this will prove that we once more are in a transition state, that we're traveling back again from the region to which the gospel brought us to that in which it found us. Very Victorian flowery language, but you get what he means. In other words, what he's saying is this, if the pursuit of tolerance in society results in the general erosion of the public confidence in objective truth, then pluralism will not lead to a neutral secular society on matters of religion, but an anti-Christian pagan one like ancient Rome. Pluralism will only tolerate pluralists and will not look kindly on those who believe in truth with a capital T. Now what those who blindly go along with the new tolerance fail to see is that it is only objective truth which preserves all our freedoms. If it's a matter of mere relativism on questions of belief or morality, then argumentation and rational persuasion won't have any place. It will then be left to the loudest voices or those with the greatest political clout to ensure that they get their own way. And the stronger their uh, instruments of doing that, the media, then the effect is going to be quite devastating. The way of persuasion will then be overtaken by coercion. 
And that, I think, we see happening today in Western Europe and here in the United States. That's the bad news. <laughs> Now, is there a biblical basis for true toleration? That is, extending to others the respect to basic rights which we would wish others to extend to others, to us. In fact, there are, and they rest upon four fundamental pillars. First, the nature of human beings. Now, Scripture presents human beings as those who make significant choices, and therefore, that entails personal responsibility. And to reduce this capacity in a person, either by political or religious coercion, or technological or social manipulation, is to make a person less than God has made them to be. Since God relates to Adam as a responsible moral agent in the Garden of Eden, by bestowing upon him what Blaise Pascal called the dignity of causality, Christians and all people of goodwill should seek to uphold, protect, and enhance this aspect of a person's being as one who is made in God's image. It was the literary critic George Steiner who wrote, More than Homo sapiens, we are Homo queerens, the animal that ass and ass. Now, this is an expression of people being made in the image of God. And therefore, any move to prevent those kind of questions being thought or asked, even under the guise of tolerance, must firmly be resisted. Second, the nature of the biblical ethic. To go no further than the second great commandment to love your neighbor as yourself, Mark 12, 31, and the golden rule, do to others as you would have them do to you, Luke 6, 31. We have a significant moral motive in promoting true toleration. It's out of neighbor love that we would wish people to exercise their God-given capacities to think and to decide what they should believe and how they should express those beliefs. And this command also provides the boundary limits for toleration. The sort of fence around the playground of ideas so that within those boundaries we may play at liberty and safely. So the love of neighbor would forbid oppression and victimization, as well as those practices which aim at the impoverishment and destruction of our neighbor. For example, when people are threatened with violence, physical or verbal. So the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, actually captures the moral direction in which we are to move. Christians would desire that members of other faiths and no faiths extend to them freedom to worship as they wish and to promote their religious views. Well, by the same token, Christians must insist that the same courtesy is extended to them. That is showing genuine respect. But more than this, the church, and this is very important, the church itself should model true toleration. Now again, this does not mean becoming weak and wishy-washy about our convictions. Now in an institution like this, you have staff and students who presumably reflect a broad spectrum of Christian traditions. And it is only good and proper that those beliefs are respected and also hopefully discussed and debated, but with courtesy and consideration. Now, sure, sometimes such discussion will be passionate, but always tempered with respect. Uh, there's a lovely story of a, a young cub reporter that was landed the job of interviewing a couple in his town who had celebrated their 60th wedding anniversary. And as he sat there in the old couple's living room with pen and notebook in hand, He listened on as they related how they first met soon after the war, the hard times they faced piecing together a home, 
the building of a family when employment was not easy. And, but it was obvious from the way they looked at each other, their eyes, they still loved each other deeply. And, and, and somewhat awestruck by the length of time the couple had been married, rather indelicately, the young reporter asked, Tell me, during those 60 years, did you ever consider divorce? And the old man, slowly shaking his head, replied, Divorce? Never. Murder? Many times. <laughs> the point is, concern for important things can be passionate. But then there's the nature of the gospel. The gospel is news of what God has done in Jesus Christ. And that news calls for a response of repentance and faith, trust. Whilst affirming the enabling work of the Holy Spirit in the act of regeneration, John 3.3, 3, you must be born again, this does not entail coercion, force. The gospel itself attests to the freedom and responsibility of human beings before their maker and is itself a means of bringing about true freedom, Freedom from the curse of the law, Galatians 4. Freedom to act in ways we were designed to think and act by keeping in step with the Spirit, Galatians 5. But then we come to the nature of the kingdom of God. You see, if the kingdom of God is to be identified with an earthly political institution, then of course it is a short step to implementing earthly means to establish it. And this was the folly of the Crusades and the persecution of free churchmen in the 17th century by the established church in Great Britain. Of course, they came over here. Now, Paul insists, the Apostle Paul insists that the weapons we use are not the weapons of this world. 2 Corinthians 10.4 This is a kingdom which is truly inclusive. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, neither male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Galatians 3.28 And as Christians, we ask to seek to display that, the, that in kingdom outposts, namely local churches. So in conclusion, as Jesus did not repay evil for evil, but set forth the way of the cross where strength is realized in weakness, that is the way we, his followers, are to travel. As citizens of a democratic society, we are free, in fact, I'd say obligated, to use all legitimate means at our disposal to argue, to persuade and to change views and opinions. Not in order to impose our beliefs, but to work out those beliefs in a way we think will best benefit our neighbor and honor our God. But if we follow the way of the cross, then the road we tread may be a very painful road. It will be a road which will entail rejection and abuse because it happened to Jesus. The call for the church in the secularized West to be prepared to suffer also rounds off Professor Carson's treatment of the corrosive effect of secularization in producing a more intolerant society. But he also offers these words of encouragement with which I would like to conclude. He says, Delight in God and trust in Him. God remains sovereign, wise, and good. Our ultimate confidence is not in any government or party, still less in our ability to mold the culture in which we live. Thank you very much for listening so attentively.
Well, thank you so much. What a, a wonderful and thoughtful and insightful and stimulating and provocative uh, beginning of a conversation. We really are, are so glad you're here Pleasure. tonight. Thank you. thank you. We will never again, uh, as we contemplate what toothpaste to buy, uh, <laughs> uh, never quite see that in exactly the same way. I've been reading a book called Good Faith that's by Gabe Lyons and uh, Dave Kenneman from the Barna Group, a couple of Mm -hmm. relatively young evangelical Christians in America. And uh, they have a thesis uh, in their book that, and I think it, it flows out of what you said tonight, that uh, the consequence of some of the changes in our culture that you've described is that Christians are perceived, they say, in two ways. One is that they're extreme, mm -hmm. and two is that they're irrelevant. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, it's a pretty startling diagnosis of the problem. And the book then seeks to address how do Christians respond to that kind of environment. I wonder, is that, do you agree with the diagnosis? <clears throat> and what's our response in that kind of cultural milieu? Well, let me take the second one first, that we're irrelevant. Um, in order to understand where, we're, where we are as a culture, we've, we've got to take into account what... Um, the sociologist uh, Peter Berger called plausibility structures, that every society has certain assumptions, certain values, which are just given. Uh, they're part of the cultural air you, you breathe. You don't have to think about them, they're just there. And if anyone starts to question those, then they, they hit some sort of resistance. Now, it's, it's more marked in Europe uh, and Great Britain, I do distinguish us from Europe, so there we are. Um, then this is over here in the United States, because uh, just looking at what was going on yesterday and, uh, and uh, Secretary uh, Hillary Clinton's um, uh, concession, uh, concession address, that, that she even mentioned God, yes. that she even quoted the Bible, that would never, ever, ever happen in Britain. Right. There would be political death. You, you, you just cannot do that. Uh, but this is a tremendous ease with which one can still, whether you believe it or not, uh, refer to Christian things. But as a result of uh, sort of what's called the secularization process, where, whereby religion has been pushed further and further to the margins of society, then invariably Christianity seems irrelevant. Um, there's what, uh, again, Max Weber, one of the processes of this secularization process is called disenchantment. And what he means by that is that, uh, whereas at one time when there was a, say, Christian civilization, um, there was clearly a belief in, in God and, and prayer and, 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 and you use ministers and they all had their place right very much at the center of society. Uh, but now, if you're ill, you don't go to a priest, you go to a physician. Um, you, um, you may pray if you're, you're desperate, whatever, but, but basically we feel we can deal with it. We, 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 we can do it. And so again, with that sort of can-do-it mentality, uh, where God is increasingly distant, the church is okay for those who are that way inclined, it's just one hobby amongst others, then what is... Christianity to do with the world of economics, science, sociology. It seems, it feels irrelevant. So I, 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 I go with that. Mm -hmm. um, the second, uh, the first thing you mentioned was being extreme. Well, it's interesting. Um, everyone who's to the right of me is an extremist. <laughs> it's, again, relative. And it, it, it seems to me that now anybody who has convictions and believes in truth in a situation where everything is relative and pluralism reigns, is bound to seem extreme. Just to believe with conviction things now makes you an extremist. Mm. Um, the trouble is, uh, because of what is happening with genuine militant extremism, uh, then one way in which you can um, silence Christians is simply by dubbing them extremists. Not only then do you not take them seriously, but you then consider them to be dangerous, and so they've got to be 
be dealt with. That's right. Uh, so I think that's where we're going. It's a very tricky situation we're in. And so how do we, res how do we respond to, uh, and I know that's a, that's a, yeah, well, yeah. a three-day course, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, well, I think, first of all, um, I, I sort of hinted at it there t towards the end. I think, first of all, Christians, and particularly the church itself, must model true tolerance. Um, that we show respect to each other, that we do listen to each other, we respect the person, um, and uh, we allow freedom of, of debate. Now, that doesn't mean that within a denomination, for example, there are not limits. Uh, there is such a thing as church discipline, and certain beliefs are beyond the pale. That seems to be against a free country. So in my denomination, for example, uh, if, a, if a minister or a bishop or whatever says they no longer believe in God, that's their choice, but don't pick up the paycheck from a denomination that does believe in God. That's right. You do the decent thing, as Gresham yes. Machen said, and you resign. You become a Buddhist or whatever you want to be. <laughs> but don't be uh, um, inconsistent and, and don't be a cheat and, and take other people's things. So I think we've got to, to model it. I think we've also got to model it not only within the church, but also to the world. So if we... Um, do just start taking to the streets with our banners and, and we ourselves uh, contribute to the, the, the shrill nature of debate that goes on in our society, then, well, rightly, we are going to be called extremists. Mm. So again, outside, we've got to take a stand. We've got to engage uh, people um, graciously, but clearly. Yes. And without... Um, being apologetic in the wrong sense. Yes. We have some, uh, if you have questions, I think we have some folks wandering around and, and uh, they can give you a card and you can, uh, uh, or maybe you already have a card, you can write down a question. We'd, be, we'd love to uh, take some questions from, from you all for, for Melvin during our time together tonight. So look for one of our wonderful LCU students who's uh, uh, offering those up to you. Thank you for, for your help. I, I want to venture into some uh, 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 some of the headlines and, and see what you think uh, if, if uh, you've had an interesting moment in your country with Brexit and uh, we've had an interesting week in our country with the presidential election. No. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I wonder if, uh, if you observe in those two outcomes any, any lessons that we can take that relate to the themes you've been talking about tonight <laughs> a reaction to a certain way of seeing the world, a certain way of acting in the world? I wonder, is there, are there lessons to be learned there? Are you, what, what are you observing? Mm. Well, I, I think it's, again, um, disturbing um, looking at the, the reaction going on over here at the moment. It was exactly the same over in, in Britain with, with Brexit. That when a result uh, comes out, which is not the liking to some people, that is not going to be acceptable to them. And uh, no matter, you know, that they had a, a free vote, um, they were able to express their views, it's a democratic process. When it does not go their way, then they throw out the toys from the pram, as it were, uh, and behave simply like children. You have to translate the word pram. Pram. Uh, what, what do you call a perambulator? I think it's you know, a stroller. A stroller. A stroller. Okay, stroller. Yeah. Okay, throw yeah. out the toys of the stroller. stroller. <laughs> um, <laughs> And, 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 it, and, it, and it is a, a sort of pretty puerile, childish uh, reaction. <laughs> you simply have not got your way. But again, notice what's going on. It's not, uh, I mean, I, I had someone told me today that um, some people in Britain are, are, are signed a petition uh, so that uh, none of um, President-elect Trump's speeches are, uh, are, are broadcast or published. <laughs> uh, crazy. Um, but you know, what does that tell you? I mean, if, if, if you believe in your position, then argue it. And, and in order to argue against someone, you need to know what they think. So to silence them by saying, well, we're not going to have Trump's mm. broad uh, speeches, is, is just, it's just foolish and counterproductive. Yes. Um, so... Yeah, so I, I, th I think it's just very disturbing to, to look at the, the response uh, that people have made. Mm. Um, but this is 
where we're at. We, we, we don't seem to have the ability to engage in, in, in civil, reasonable, ration, rational discussion. Mm. Yes, passionate at times. Yes. But we must be able to do that. Otherwise, liberty is going to go out the window. Yes. Amen. I loved what you said toward the end of your remarks tonight, that the, the kingdom of God is, is truly inclusive. Citing mm -hmm. Galatians 3.28, there's neither male nor female, that great passage. How do, how do we model? In our, you, you pointed to the local church as a place where that ought to be mm. modeled. What does, that, what does that look like? Do you have some examples or thoughts about how do we model true inclusivity in our churches? Well, I think you need to look, well, to, to, some, de uh, to some degree, it's a matter of your demogra demographics as to where you are as, as a church. But um, just looking at my own church, St. John's at the moment, uh, what, one of the things that has, has thrilled me to see over the years um, is what an incredibly diverse church it is. Um, that we have a wide range of ages. Uh, we have people from different classes, so, sort of social groups. Um, we have people from different nations. We have uh, people from uh, Africa and, and China and Korea, uh, all together um, in, in, one, in one body, uh, worshiping the mm. one Lord. Mm. Um, and also to acknowledge that and to facilitate that, from time to time we have songs which are not in English, mm. but in a different language. Mm. Uh, we, we know what it means, yes. but again, that is, is not just a token. It, it mm. is a genuine attempt to express the variety uh, that is there in the local church, which is meant to be uh, a, a, um, a projection, if you like, of the heavenly church, yes. where you have this multitude that no one can number yes. from every tribe and, and people group. Um, so I think that's, that's one way we need to do it. I think we need to be careful... Um, you know, about some of the language uh, we, we use um, so that we don't unnecessarily uh, exclude folk. Mm. Some of the illustrations that we use, I'm talking to the preacher now, mm -hmm. uh, and, and again, just recognizing the inclusivity. So all these are little ingredients which I think do help to, uh, to make a church this kind of model we've been talking about. Yes. Uh, how do we, so, so we, we want to, uh, you talked a lot about truth tonight mm -hmm. and the perils uh, that, uh, to understanding an objective uh, a notion of truth in, in light of the, the tyranny of tolerance. So, so how do we engage? You, talked about, you also talked about critical engagement. How do we engage in conversations with our friends and neighbors about the capital T truth of the gospel uh, in a way that is productive, in a way that advances uh, the message in a way that doesn't uh, lead to this kind of... Uh... That's a broad question. It, it, to some degree, it depends who we're talking to, um, you know, what their particular concerns are, what their interests are, and to, and to try and find ways in, genuinely, um, to, um, you know, to relate the Christian faith to whatever it is. So whether, you know, one's talking to a scientist, there may be a thing in there. Uh, someone working at a nursery or, or whatever, or their uh, home situation uh, or whatever, but to, to, to try and um, uh, relate in, in that way. Um, I think sometimes we were a bit shy in discussing things which are of common concern. Um, so, for example, okay, you've, you've, you've had your presidential election. You know, how are you going to talk to your non-Christian friends about what's happened yeah. um, without it being simply partisan. You know, what, what Christian values and perspectives should you be bringing to, I'm not saying you, but you uh, bringing to bear to the situation as you now have found it? Um, I, I'm, we, we keep hearing on the news what a divided country this is at yes. the moment. Um, well... Um, I'd have thought that's a great opportunity for going a bit deeper as to why, almost by nature, we are divisive. And then we're talking about the nature of man and our sinful inclinations, and then to talk about a way in which the gospel itself, as we've seen, uh, should unite. 
So we've got some questions here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, let, me, let me share some of the questions from the audience. Here's a question about what is the influence of uh, Muslims in England today and on the Christian church? Uh, Muslims on the Christian church. Yes, yes. How are you seeing that influence working its way out in England? <clears throat> well, it, it, um, it will vary from region to region, uh, whether there's a large Muslim population uh, or not. I'll give you one example uh, where this sort of, this kind of toler intolerant tolerance uh, showed itself, and that was in um, part of our country called the Midlands, where one local council place called Dudley um, banned any um, pictures or any um, uh, symbols or any, any representation of pigs. Um, so whether you had a little badge or a calendar with pigs, and this is pig breeding country, by the way. <laughs> um, so, you know, calendars with pigs on, you know, sort of great um, black whatever it is, you know. Um, and even to the point of uh, a tissue, a box of tissues which had Winnie the Pooh on, had to go because it had piglet. And the reason given by the council was that these must be removed was because it could be offensive to Muslims. And um, the, um, one of the Muslim leaders insisted that this be so. Now, it seems to me, there you're talking about something quite different. There you've got an example of sort of Muslim supremacy coming in. Mm. Um, and uh, invariably, that is going to, if, if anything, create more tension and resentment by those who think, well, come on, we've, we've had pictures of pigs here for centuries because we, we breed the things. <laughs> um, and that's not helpful. Mm. Uh, whereas as we've seen, true tolerance is putting up with that which you don't mm. agree. And it's not that these you know, folk, are, you know, it's not that folk are going in, say, to a mosque parading a picture of a pig. That would be quite offensive and yes. a stupid thing to do. But here we've got a public building uh, where still the majority are white Anglo-Saxons, for want of a better word, uh, and yet um, this has been imposed. So you, you've got that kind of thing. We've also had problems um, more recently in the news with, with uh, faith school, what's called faith schools, Muslim schools, um, where certain uh, extreme um, views and behavior have, have been seen, and so um, steps have had to be taken to to stop that. Mm. It, it, it varies. In terms of the church, um, I don't think it, uh, Islam particularly has influenced the, the stance of, say, the established church, which is the Church of England. It, it's much more um, this what we've, we, that, that we've been talking about, um, that Christianity is being seen as simply one faith amongst many others. Um, and, and so one cannot put forward the, the gospel in, in terms of its truth claims. Um, so I think that's what's happening. Yes. Well, uh, here's a question of, that uh, references Charles Taylor's A Secular Age. Yes. Uh, and uh, has a comment about uh, his uh, premise that uh, as a society becomes more progressive, uh, more secular uh, references to transcendent realities become more rare. Uh, and it asks, where do you see people seeking transcendence in Britain? <laughs> right. What Charles Taylor is doing there is um, going against what's called the secularization thesis, put simply, uh, that as a society becomes more and more modern with the advancement of science, there'll be a decline in religion because people will recognize that's, that's, that's sort of superstitious and belongs to a past age. And so um, the more intelligent we become, the more technical we become, and scientific we become, religion itself would decline. Now that uh, secularization thesis has been blown out of the water, uh, not least by your country. This is the most advanced, technological, scientifically sophisticated country in the world. And yet, uh, religion, not only in terms of 
Christian church attendance, but other faiths as well, is, is very, very, very strong. I think. Am I okay? So, yeah, you came back. I came back. Okay. <laughs> Someone's trying to tell me something. <laughs> um, but what is what what is happening? It's probably your your case as well, but but certainly in in Britain, is that whereas um, formal allegiance to the church is declining. Uh, I mentioned earlier on to, to the um, folk at the meal that uh, our, my denomination is losing a thousand people a week and is going like that. Uh, nonetheless, um, religious uh, um, how can I put it? Religious dispositions are still strong. Um, Often it's that people make up their own religion. It's a sort of DIY. They take a bit from there, <laughs> there and a bit from that religion and make their own. And so the term people are using is spirituality. Mm -hmm. I'm a spiritual person, even if they don't set foot in a mosque or a synagogue or in, in a church. And so it seems to me that is what's happening. I think this is Taylor's point. So we shouldn't l just measure a nation's religiosity by the attendance of uh, at a particular uh, religious grouping meeting uh, you've got to look at what people are claiming to believe and the vast majority of people in the planet believe in a god mm. of some sort mm. um, and and uh, I think that's that's the point yeah yeah well we have uh the most amazing students here at Love of Christian University. I've met some of them. Some, some of, I, some I, of them are, are here. You got to speak to some of them in a yeah, class this terrific. afternoon. We're so thankful and proud of our students. I have three children who are in that uh, millennial age, college, and a little bit older. And uh, when I look at this generation, I, uh, I have a great uh, admiration of them, but also great uh, uh, sympathy or even empathy for mm. the challenges they face they're inundated with this way of thinking. They're children of a postmodern world and a way of seeing the world. So I wonder, as a, as a way to, a concluding word mm -hmm. of uh, nurture and admonition to uh, those uh, of our, uh, the, the, the future of the church, uh, is how do, how do they uh, resist this yeah. uh, pervasive uh, way that they are confronted in the world of, of uh, tolerance as a primary virtue? Yeah, well, let me say, I, I think this generation and the generation coming up um, have some of the greatest pressures and greatest difficulties um, ever any generation has had to face, not only in terms of questions of the future of the planet and all that kind of thing, but for the very um, reasons you, you've already uh, given their principle, um, that... Um, they're, they're facing pressures and temptations and stresses that we, we've never had to face. Okay, we, we've all had to face different pressures. Every generation has to, to meet them. But the pressures today are very subtle. Uh, they're very per pervasive, um, not least because of the technological advances that have, have taken place. They're exposed to, to things that they don't necessarily want to be exposed to, but they are. Um, and not least, this sort of drip, drip, drip acid effect mm. of, uh, of relativism. Mm. Now, it seems to me the only way in which that is not only going to be resisted, but overcome, and, um, uh, and there's going to be progress, is that the, these young people themselves dig deep into the Bible, that they themselves have genuine, firm convictions that this is true. It's not just true for them, it is true. Not only do they need convictions, but they need courage. Mm. And that means a courage to stand up and to stand out. And therefore, they also need the support of all the generations, not simply saying, oh, well, it wasn't like that in our day. We've got to support them, understand them, and strengthen them. And that means praying for them. And for, them, for they themselves to be convinced that Christianity 
is true. The Lord Jesus Christ is beautiful and wonderful and glorious, and there's nothing else that compares to him. Amen. And if the heart is convicted in that way, and there are thousands and millions of them, then we'll see a, a genuine movement. And we trust to God and we pray to God for a genuine awakening mm. as happened in this country in the 18th century. That's right. That's, That's right. what we need today, a genuine awakening. Thank you. Thank you so much for blessing us tonight. Won't you join me in showing your appreciation you. to Melvin Teacher? Thank, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.